Good afternoon to this uh, virtual lecture from Andy Singleton from NIH. I will introduce Andy, it's a truly a pleasure. Andy is, uh, uh, I, will, I would like only to say that he is a fantastic scientist and an even better person. And uh, I think that will qualify him fully, but I will add, you know, a few details. Andy received his, uh, uh, the CFBS from the uh, University of Sutherland, UK, and his PhD for University of Newcastle upon time in the UK. And his research was initially focused on the genetic determinant of dementia. Uh, he did his postdoctoral work at the Mayo Clinic and then moved to the National Institute of Aging, where he became a senior investigator in 2007 and the laboratory chief in 2008. In 2016, he became an NIH distinguished investigator and in 2021, he became the director of the new Center for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementia or friendly so called CARD. And in this new role, Andy has demonstrated that he's not only a wonderful scientist and a very insightful person, but also a leader of people and a wonderful organizer. Andy has organized, uh, has published more than 700 articles, so never try to print uh, his CV because uh, you have to say trees. His group has worked mostly on uh, the genetic uh, or neurological disorder, mostly neurodegenerative disorder, including Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, dystonia, ataxia, dementia, and Levy body disease. Uh, in amyotrophy lateral sclerosis. And, and, and the goal of this research is really to glimpse, you know, an opportunity for treatment uh, that can be opened in the future in a field that really then need new treatment, uh, new effective treatment desperately. Andy served on several editorial board and advisory board and as, uh, uh, you know, the best, the good scientist he is. He has won many, many awards. I will just cite the Anne Marie Oprecht Award for Parkinson's Disease Research, the J. Van Andel Award for Outstanding Achievement in Parkinson's Disease Research, and the American Academy of Neurology Movement Disorder Award. Thank you, Andy, for accepting to give this lecture. We are heading for a treat, and I look forward to listening from you of your wonderful science. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you um, so much for the kind um, for the kind introduction. Um, so, and it's a real pleasure to give this give this talk today. I wish it was in person, but uh, this will this will have to do. Um, so, I've been in the intramural research program, as Luigi said, for uh, twenty one years now. Which, uh, if someone had told me that twenty one years ago, I would never have believed it. But um, kind of the theme of the theme of uh, an underlying theme of this talk is how special the intramural program um, is. And I think that's a large part of the reason why so many of us who uh, came here uh, slightly less gray and quite a lot younger um, tend to hang around for a while because it really is a, a wonderful place to, to, to work. Um, many of you know this already, but um, uh, there are some, I think we're in a really privileged position in the intramural research um, program. We can do some things that are slightly different to the rest of, um, to the rest of the world, largely because of the things I've written here. You know, we have stable, generous resources. We're pretty secure. Our review isn't uh, entirely prospective. Um, uh, we can um, define our own metrics of success. Uh, we can fail. Um, we have this uh, a tolerance for, for failure. And all of these things, I think, come together to mean that we can take on some things that, that, that can't readily be taken on. And um, this will be part of the theme of what I'm going to talk about um, uh, today. Really, the theme is that um, we've used our position, or I've used my position in my lab and, and my colleagues um, in the lab too, to um, really uh, create a, a cooperative research network. And I'm going to talk um, entirely about Parkinson's today, and I'm going to talk entirely about Parkinson's genetics today. But I would say this stretches to other domains. It certainly stretches to, to um, other diseases, but also outside of genetics into, um, into functional domains. And we've really taken that seriously. And 
in our lab. As Luigi mentioned, I ran the lab of neurogenetics for, for a, a fairly long time, but uh, we had a, a collective management structure and we're all on the same page. All of the leaders within that lab were on the same page about how we can essentially use our position in the intramural program and, and the collaborative framework of our lab to really affect um, fundamental change in neurodegenerative disease research. So I'm a, I'm a geneticist. We are incredibly simple people. We are the simplest of scientists, I think, um, as you can tell by this, uh, this framework here. And really, I think this is worth thinking about at the beginning of every um, talk that's centered on genetics. Why do we take, why do we, um, why do we focus on trying to identify genes that underlie disease? Of course, the idea is if you can, um, if you can find a gene that is causative or a risk factor for disease, it's like seeing um, the opening title sequence of a movie. It gives you an idea about what the movie, uh, where the movie is going to go. Uh, you get an idea of, of kind of um, what the framework is for the movie, and you get a starting point to start to try and tease out what's what's going to happen. So we use genetics to um, as a starting point to understand the pathobiology of disease, all with the idea of not just understanding biology, but with um, identifying uh, viable points for therapeutic intervention. I think over recent years, in the last decade or so, we've realized that there is more to it than just that, that it's not enough just to um, understand the biology of a disease and look for targets, but for um, particularly the diseases that, that we work on, late onset neurodegenerative diseases, we need to, to dissect the disease as well. We need to be able to predict when someone's going to um, get a disease well before the, the onset of uh, signs and symptoms. And we also need to be able to classify the disease into mechanistic subtypes. So this is all moving towards the notion of being able to identify the right patient at the right time and apply the right, um, the right target. So I'm gonna talk um, about the work from my lab. This is not the only, um, uh, genetics work that's been going on in Parkinson's disease. Other groups have been working around uh, around the world on, on PD, but I think that um, we've had a really uh, outsized contribution. Um, so I'm going to talk about the things that we've really um, contributed to, and I'm going to split it into two broad domains. Um, first of all, uh, monogenic disease, then complex disease. Um, so it's going to be a little asynchronous because, of course, we did both at the same um, both at the same time. So I'll talk about progress. And then I'm going to talk um, about where we're going next, um, um, what the challenges are that I see in this particular space. So really, this is the first um, I worked I, before I moved to the US, I was working in the genetics of um, dementia, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies and, and Alzheimer's disease. When I moved to the US in uh, around 1999, I started to work on on um, Parkinson's disease. And this was really one of the first um, uh, pieces of work that we started to uh, embark on. And it's, it's kind of interesting actually, because it comes back to some of the work that um, I've been involved in in, in uh, the most recent uh, five or six uh, years. So this was a family um, that we uh, studied actually from the DC area. This is a black family with um, Parkinson's disease. And um, incredibly surprisingly at the time, we found that uh, um, the mutation that was underlying disease in this family was a spinocerebellar ataxia three um, mutation. This normally causes um, ataxia. These mutations really weren't associated with um, Parkinson's disease. As we started to collect more families and, and look at more literature in this space, it became apparent that um, what we were seeing here is that um, a, a genetic cause of disease can uh, present in different ways um, based on ancestral. Um, based on ancestral background. So uh, um, uh, this finding back in, uh, which we made actually in 1999, took us uh, two and a half years to publish because actually nobody believed it. They thought that it was just um, simply misdiagnosis of, of, of disease. Um, and that in part is because we think of, uh, because Parkinson's disease is really um, traditionally a white construct. What we know about Parkinson's disease, what we know about the clinical presentation of Parkinson's disease is based largely on work done in individuals of Northern European ancestry. And I will kind of come back to this, come back to this point um, later on in the slides. Um, not long after moving to the US, uh, we made this discovery. So um, the first gene that was found in Parkinson's disease was found in uh, 1997 by Bob Nussbaum's group. Bob was at uh, NHGRI in the intramural program. And it was this um, uh, gene alpha synuclein, uh, the protein product of which 
is um, a constituent part of Lewy bodies, which are, are the pathognomic hallmark for, for Parkinson's um, disease. But the mutations that had been found were point mutations. So they were qualitative changes in, in synuclein. What we found in, in 2003 was that uh, actually a rare cause of Parkinson's disease is these quantitative changes in synuclein where extra gene copies lead to extra production of synuclein and that is enough to drive disease in um, individuals uh, 20s or 30s. So this took a, this took a long time to, to find. Um, uh, this, this certainly took many years to, to find and it's something that you could find now in a couple of days with, with modern technology. But at the time it was fairly, um, it was fairly groundbreaking. It told us um, what I've already stated, which is that um, just, in, just increasing the amount of snooplin was enough to cause disease. And this is a mechanism which I think still um, holds true today and is uh, relevant not only for mutations, but for risk factors. It told us, um, it also told us that um, we had to be really careful about modeling. However, expression models were the norm then, and um, that certainly has um, uh, an impact on the implications of the models. Lastly, um, it told us something about um, therapeutic opportunities. If producing too much synuclein um, can cause a rare disease, a rare form of Parkinson's disease, and we think that common variability also affects synuclein levels, then maybe targeting synuclein clearance or reducing its expression is a viable point of therapeutic intervention. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Not long after that, a year or so later, um, our lab, um, along with um, a couple of collaborators and um, some competing labs uh, found the LERC2 mutation um, to contain, the LERC2 gene to contain mutations that cause um, pretty typical uh, Parkinson's disease. So this LERC2 encodes leucine rich repeat um, kinase. What was particularly interesting about um, this discovery is that um, all of the previous genes that had been identified uh, and associated with um, associated with rare forms of dis with uh, disease were generally quite rare. So synuclein mutations were extremely rare. Parkinson mutations were extremely rare. This is not true for LERC2. So um, LERC2 uh, mutations, particularly one mutation, uh, GTO19S, which is a mutation in the kinase um, domain. Um, this is responsible for about uh, one in 50 cases of Parkinson's disease in North America. So about 20,000 individuals in North America have Parkinson's disease due to uh, um, a LERC2 mutation. This, um, this frequency changes pretty drastically from population to population. If you look at the Ashkenazi Jewish population, about one in five Parkinson's disease cases carry this mutation. If you look in the North African Berber Arab population, um, it's, almost, it's almost one in two. This was also a really great learning experience for me. Um, this was a great learning experience um, um, about the power of the intramural program and about collaboration. Um, we knew in, in, in those days, um, we were racing others to find this gene and we knew that the way to do this was to collaborate. So um, using um, the resources we could bring to bear from the, from the IRP, you know, ability to sequence um, a, a great speed and to bring information together, we worked with groups from Spain and London, and really, um, really, that collaboration and that speed led us to led us to um, to to win this uh, race to identify the gene. The second part that I think was really revealing um, uh, was uh, the beauty of the intramural program in that we can pivot very quickly and we can change resources very quickly. So the day we found this, Mark Cookson, um, who's a PI I've worked with for. 25 years, it's been wonderful to work with him over those 25 years. Mark Cookson changed the direction of his lab almost overnight to start working on, on LERC2. So, uh, and, and actually the work that he did showing that kinase activity was um, key for, for the uh, toxic gain of function for LERC2 has really translated to some um, therapeutic consequences, which I'll talk a, a little bit about, um, talk a little bit about later. Um, not long after this, uh, uh, and again in this theme of finding mutations that present differently um, or can have different um, outcomes, we found uh, this gene, uh, PLA2G6, which had um, um, uh, previously uh, been shown to uh, mutations in this gene had previously been associated with an infantile um, neurodegenerative disease. We showed that, that these can um, cause a dystonia Parkinsonism syndrome. So now we're around 2009. We've gone through these experiences of individual gene um, hunting escapades where we're you know, chasing genes like, like crazy, 
starting to think about um, working more collaboratively with other groups. Um, genetics was an incredibly competitive endeavor back in uh, the late 90s and early 2000s. But around this time, um, our group really started to think about the power of working with others. Um, so in 2009, along with um, around 10 or, 10 or so other investigators from around the world, uh, we formed this consortium, the International PD um, Genomics Consortium. And the idea here was to create a group that could work together really quickly and um, uh, share data very quickly without, without um, uh, too many encumbrances. Again, the IRP was really central in the creation and the success of, of IPDGC. Um, because we were able to provide quick genotyping, quick sequencing, quick resources to get things off the ground and to get things moving. Whilst the other investigators were having to write grants and apply for funding, we could really seed progress very, very quickly. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, IPDGC has also discovered uh, mutations. So um, VPS13C, which I think is a fascinating um, uh, cause of, of Parkinson's disease and also um, created a network to kind of correct or course correct uh, the literature. Um, now genetics is relatively accessible for many people. So, um, uh, so anyone with access to samples and a sequencer can do whole genome sequencing. What this has effectively led to though in the, in the Parkinson's field is um, a very large number of uh, genes published um, or mutations in genes published that, that just really probably aren't, aren't right. So we've been able to use the structure of the IPDGC to kind of correct the literature as time's gone on. And actually, this has been a, a, um, a double whammy because we've used this um, process to train students. We have a, a group of around uh, 40 or so students in the IPDGC training network, and they're tasked with checking up on, on new genes and, and publishing, these, um, publishing these studies in very large, very large cohorts. So where has that led us? Where has this work in um, monogenic disease led us? It's led us to um, around uh, 17 or so plausible genes that contain mutations that cause um, Parkinson's disease. An area that you know, I said I would talk only about the things that we were really, that we really heavily drove. I'm gonna make one exception. Um, so this is work really driven by Ellen Sidransky. Um, we, we certainly participated in Mike Knowles um, who was a young a statistician at the time was was the, the lead uh, analyst for, for this. But um, this is really beautiful work that, that Ellen drove that showed um, um, glucocerebrosidase mutations, which um, uh, when uh, a recessive, uh, in a recessive form cause Gaucher's disease, when you carry them in a single, as a single heterozygous mutation, are a significant risk factor for Parkinson's disease. There had been publications before this implicating um, GBA mutations in Parkinson's disease. But I have to say the field didn't really believe it. Um, and I think this publication really, um, really proved this beyond, beyond a doubt. And again, this was about bringing people together. And I think it's no, um, it, it's no surprise that someone from the intramural program, Ellen, was able to bring together research groups from around the world and really prove this association. So we have you know, 17 or so um, a, a disease causing mutation, genes that contain disease causing mutations, a couple of moderate risk protein coding variants, uh, GBA that I mentioned here, and also um, actually uh, Asian specific variants in LERC2. In LERC so what about complex disease? So this, again, um, speaking to the power of the intramural program, this was something that we got involved in really, really early. Um, because we, at the time um, when we started doing this in 2004, 2005, um, high content genotyping was really new technology. There was still a huge amount of debate as to whether this would actually work. Would genome-wide association work? And we were able to um, tolerate the potential failure of it not working. Uh, we were able to um, bring um, genome-wide genotyping into the lab and just begin working and begin generating data. Actually, our first study um, was the first study to release genome-wide genotyping SNP data into the public domain. I think it was only the third um, genome-wide association study published um, um, at the time, and we published it in 2006. And it was an embarrassingly small number of samples, 267 cases and 267 controls. So as you can see in this plot, here, um, 
uh, zero new loci as one would expect. But it, but it was incredibly useful for us. It was incredibly useful for us because it um, taught us immediately that the right thing to do was to put data into the public domain so that it could be mined by others and actually added to by others, right? The data is essentially digital in, in its form. So, so um, uh, contributing to, to the data to the, to the general public or the general research public means that others can add samples and, and we can increase um, sample, sample sizes. It also showed that we could handle the data, we could do this kind of work in the lab. And I think this was really a uh, key in making us a leader in this, in this space. Um, not, not much longer after this in 2009, um, again, around this time that we're starting to think about really collaborating heavily, we worked with um, our, a competing group, the group that we'd been racing to discover the look to um, mutation against back in 2004. So this is Tom Gass's group. And we brought together genome-wide data from the US and from Germany and started to identify um, a, a new risk loci. So actually the, the two risk loci you see here are, um, one is in synuclein. So again, you know, mutations in synuclein cause Parkinson's um, disease, but now we know that common variability around synuclein is a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. The other is a locus on chromosome 17. That's very interesting. It's, it contains um, uh, the gene uh, micro tubule um, associated protein tau. Um, we don't know if tau is the effector gene there, but um, this is a, 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 an important finding. Not much longer after that, of course, we formed IPDGC and IPDGC has been incredibly productive um, in the monogenic space, but even more so in the complex space. Again, we were able to bring resources to bear from the intramural re research program to really um, to really get this consortium started and really start to, to um, push down on the accelerator from, from day one. And I think that was absolutely key. So IPDGC then started to ramp up. We started to generate genotype data. We started to bring data together into one space. 2011, we moved to um, uh, uh, 11 uh, new loci and actually for the first time started to do um, imputation. Imputation was really starting to get used around 2010, 2011. The same year, a second um, genome-wide association study in partnership with the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium um, identified another seven or so low size. So we're starting to gain some, some traction. And, and as you can see, one of the, one of the really um, neat things about genome-wide association studies on, on the bottom left-hand side of the screen is they're predictable in nature. You, you, you kind of know how many more loci you're going to get based on how many more samples, um, how many more samples you add. So we continue to add over that over that time, um, 2014. Now we're starting to um, uh, really get somewhere. We've gone from a space um, uh, only uh, seven or eight years previously where we were genotyping 260 samples to um, a space here where we we're genotyping 19,000 cases and uh, almost 100,000 controls and really starting to identify uh, numerous loci associated with, with Parkinson's disease. Um, a few years later, we started to work with industry. Um, so uh, um, this is including data from uh, a group at Genentech who were kind of uh, academic industry. Um, and again, really um, expanding the, the, the number of risk loci, expanding the number of cases um, so 26,000 cases, 400,000 controls. And then most recently in um, 2019, uh, we have this uh, largest genome-wide association study really driven by um, um, Mike Knowles, who I mentioned um, earlier, Cornelis uh, Blauendraut, in collaboration with 23andMe. And here we uh, were able to identify 90 independent um, risk loci. And when you start to bring those risk loci together, you can create things like genetic risk scores and um, give each individual within your genome-wide association a, a risk score. And you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, um, uh, our ability to predict case or control status on genetics alone is getting to be reasonable. We have an area under the curve of around 70%. Um, it's, not, it's definitely not perfect. Um, um, but it but it works extremely well when you start to bring in other types of data. You start to to use genetics as part of a multimodal predictor for um, for disease. Um, one of the things we've done really early on, um, which I haven't shown, is start to use um, 
uh, start to use these type of genome-wide approaches, not just for disease, but for looking at other traits. So we've done a whole series of work in uh, um, generating QTL data in human brain. So expression QTL data, DNA methylation um, um, QTL data, and merging the QTL data from um, brain, our tissue of interest, with um, the genetic data from uh, Parkinson's disease or, or um, any of the other diseases that we were working on and, and looking for intersection. You know, is this variant associated with disease? If so, what effect does it have on gene expression? What gene does it affect? What direction and what tissue? Um, whilst I'm not showing that data here, I'm showing um, some similar data, which is really single cell expression data here. And I think that, that much as genetics has been um, revolutionized by technology over the past um, 20 years. I think the next kind of foundational functional steps are being revolutionized with single cell methodologies. So what, what um, simply this is here is a FUMA analysis where you take all of your genes underneath your risk loci and you look at their expression in single cell data sets. This is a single cell data set from mouse. And you look at, um, to see whether those uh, genes underneath your genome-wide association peaks are particularly expressed in any particular cell type. So this tells you something um, about the cellular context of risk. And what we see here is that generally, not, not exclusively, but generally genome-wide association hits for Parkinson's disease, um, uh, the genes underneath those are highly expressed in neurons, particularly neurons of the substantia nigra and dopaminergic um, uh, neurons. This is not um, exclusive. Um, there are some really uh, neat data coming out showing that particular genes have effects in other cell types, but it tells you that a good place to start modeling and trying to understand um, the effects of genetic variability associated with risk for PD is dopaminergic neurons. And we also start to um, put together information on um, uh, understanding functional pathways associated with Parkinson's disease. This is work done by um, Sarah Vandress uh, Sigger, um, really uh, a monumentous effort bringing together large amount of um, um, uh, genotype data, large amount of expression data, transcriptomic community maps, and data from other diseases, Mendelian randomization disease. And it really starts to give us a flavor of, of uh, an idea of um, what are the key contributors in terms of mechanism for risk in Parkinson's disease that are being driven genetically. And, and here um, you can see that the things she identified are inflammatory signaling pathways. So, uh, cell death machinery and mitochondrial homeostasis. We, we've also looked outside of just risk for disease. Um, so um, you, you can do a genetic analysis of almost anything. Um, something uh, very obvious to do here is, this is work done by Cornelis Blauendraub, is to look at age of onset. And I had assumed when we did this, and we had good evidence for this, that um, um, Simply, we would find the same things that we'd found for a risk that we'd find for uh, age of onset. So um, we knew that um, the more, uh, the higher your genetic risk score, the younger your age of onset um, is, is likely to be. And by and large, that's true. When you do a genome-wide association study and you look at the beta values for risk versus the beta values for age of onset, as we've done on this plot on the right-hand side, they line up in a diagonal the same risk loci that um, have been identified um, as risk factors for disease also modulate age of onset with a couple of exceptions and one extremely notable exception here. So um, the MAPT locus, which is one of the first loci that you identify when you do a genome-wide association study in, in PD has absolutely no effect on age of onset. So I think this is a really Interesting observation. We're working pretty hard at, at trying to understand this by um, tackling the tau locus. Unfortunately, the tau locus is an incredibly complicated um, locus. It's a, about a one and a half million base pair inversion on chromosome 17. Um, but um, what, what we're really seeing here is that there's something that um, affects whether you get disease, but has no effect whatsoever on when you get disease. And this is, this is an exception from the norm. Um, We've also looked at genetic influence on genetic forms of disease. So I mentioned earlier that um, carrying a single GBA mutation is a risk factor for Parkinson's disease, it increases your risk for disease somewhere between two and, and five fold. Um, so of course, not everybody that carries a GBA mutation gets disease. 
um, but by doing a genome-wide association study of those um, um, GBA carriers with and without disease, we can start to identify um, genetic risk factors that modulate this, um, modulate the penetrance um, of GBA mutations. So you see two really big hits here, synuclein and CTSB. Um, if you if you do a ge genetic analysis of Parkinson's disease and you don't see synuclein, you've probably done something wrong. It shows up everywhere with everything. CTSB um, was uh, a particularly interesting, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, what we did show is, is that in general, all of the genetic risk factors for typical disease, for those folks who don't carry a GBM mutation, the 90 or so loci that we identified in the large genome-wide association studies, if you push those into a genetic risk score, that genetic risk score affects um, whether a GBA carrier um, uh, gets disease or, or not. So in general, the mechanisms between typical PD and GBA-linked um, PD seem to overlap. They don't exclusively overlap, but they seem to overlap um, for the most part. Um, this is the, the one exception. Um, so the CTSB locus, which I, I showed um, two slides ago, um, CTSB certainly shows up as a risk factor for typical Parkinson's disease, but it's much, much, much stronger in GBA-linked disease. It's about three times as strong in GBA-linked disease. And um, uh, what is particularly compelling about this is cathepsin B is a lysosomal protease. We, of course, know that glucocerebrosidase is a, um, a lysosomal protein. So um, just the very fact that, that um, out of all of the genes we could find, uh, a lysosomal cysteine protease pops up, tells me that something mechanistically is going on there and that we really are seeing a genuine gene by gene interaction and maybe some hints of um, mechanistic subtypes. So this has led us to this space, right? All of this work that I've talked about so far has um, led us to this space. 17 um, genes that contain mutations that cause disease, a couple of moderate risk factors and 90 independent loci. These are all labeled with gene names. We, we actually don't know the genes for the vast majority of them. So we've come a fairly, a fairly long way. Um, likewise, the, um, the understanding of the mechanism of these genes and their, and their products has also come a fairly long way. Um, many of these have started to be linked together mechanistically. Um, so, so Mark Cookson's lab here at NIH, Richard Yule's lab at NIH has, has linked some of these together. Genetically, we've linked things together. So we're really starting to get towards um, defining a network of genes that, um, that are underlying um, disease processes. This has had a, a, an impact therapeutically. Um, so if we just think about um, the major genes that, 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 that um, we've identified and I've talked about today, alpha synuclein, there are currently 15 um, clinical trials ongoing to targeting synuclein, uh, many of which are targeting clearance or cell-to-cell -cell transport of synuclein. Leucine rich repeat kinase 2, I mentioned that this is a kinase. Mark's work has shown um, that the kinase activity is part of the toxic gain of function. And we know that the kinase activity is increased in uh, mutation carriers. So uh, there are uh, two current trials um, targeting LERC2. Um, uh, and interestingly, actually a very large phase three clinical trial um, just beginning now um, run by Denali. Glucocerebrosidase, four current GBA directed therapies and trials. In addition to these very kind of targeted um, um, trial-based work, there's a ton of work going on in individuals that carry these mutations to try and identify biomarkers of um, progression, predictors of disease to understand the natural history of disease. So, so I think um, identifying these mutations is having a really large effect. So if we overlay what, what I've talked about so far, I think we're kind of, we certainly haven't succeeded, right? We're not at a treatment. But we've kind of hit the things we, we said we would try and hit. We're using genetics to understand the pathobiology. We're using it to identify targets. We're starting now, uh, but I'd say in our early days, to use it to try and dissect the disease, to try and predict who's going to get disease before they get it, to try and find mechanistic subtypes of, of disease, all with this aim towards precision treatments, matching the right patient to um, uh, the right treatment at the right time. So summary of where we are so far, I think we've made really significant progress in uh, the genetics of, of PD. 
Um, originally, this was driven by individual labs. Now it's just massively collaborative. And I will say the Parkinson's disease field is an incredibly um, nice one to work in, very collaborative. I think the collaboration was enabled by the willingness of that community. It was a good community. But also what was key was the, the use of the IRP to, to, to really serve as an anchor for that collaboration as a safe place to start work um, and to really generate data and bring people together. That worked incredibly well. Um, we now have a dozen or so genes um, that contain mutations that cause disease, 90 or so um, risk loci. As I, as I talked about, um, I think the cellular context is largely dopaminergic, but, but not exclusively. Um, we're starting to get a handle on um, um, the function and what is this network of, of, um, of uh, genes and their products that um, contribute to disease. I think that some of the things I'm really excited about are these outliers, these genetic factors that have more of an effect on age of onset or less of an effect on age of onset than they do on risk. And I think that um, I think these would be particularly exciting for us to chase over the coming period. So, so given that, which I think is pretty successful, what where do we go? Where do we go next? So here's here's where it's not so successful. So the uh, heritable component of Parkinson's disease now we know is uh, about 25%. So the average Parkinson's disease patient, 25% of, of their liability, 25% of the reason they have disease is genetics. We only know the identity of about a third of that. So we've got a lot more to find. Here, the really bad bit though is that the vast majority of work that we've done has been in Northern European ancestry um, patients in genetics. So Parkinson's disease is clearly a global disease, but we really have very, very little understanding of the contribution of genetics in non-Northern European ancestry patients. If we are to treat this global disease, we, uh, and using this schema again, we have, to, we have to really invest in understanding the genetic basis of disease in global populations. So I'm going to talk um, uh, as, I'm, as I'm in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes or so about this program, the Global Parkinson's Genetics Program. So this is a partnership between us and uh, the Aligning Science Across Parkinson's um, Initiative that are supporting this work and the Michael J. Fox Foundation um, who are working um, with, extremely closely with us on, on this program. So the mission of the Global Parkinson's Genetics Program or GP2 is to dramatically expand our understanding of the basis of PD and to make that knowledge globally relevant. And I, what I'm gonna talk a little bit about here is not really results, but um, how we're trying to do that. Um, we are funded as a resource or supported as a resource program. Um, so the idea is that we are not um, a space where we uh, take all of the genetics and we provide all of the answers, but rather we provide the tools and the resources and the data to, um, to ask questions. Um, to allow investigators to, to ask genetic questions. So we have three primary scientific outcomes that we're attempting to um, attack. Um, understanding complex disease, so we're genotyping 150,000 individuals. Um, identifying and proving rapidly um, new genetic causes of disease. So to do this will be uh, whole genome sequencing 10,000 individuals and long read sequencing a couple of thousand individuals. And doing all of this um, and making all of this globally relevant. So um, prioritizing uh, collection of new samples and new cohorts, the creation of no, new cohorts from black Americans, sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, South and Central America, the Caribbean, East Asia, Central, Central Asia. As important, I think, um, as anything to achieve these scientific outcomes, we have these really strong structural priorities. So democratizing the data, making data available and usable for the research community and for the folks that are actually generating examples, uh, collaborating and, and cooperating with everybody. Um, you know, uh, the idea, again, is to create a structure in which um, really a collective where investigators from all over the world have equal access to resources and are able to analyze data. Um, all of this has to be done using safe, responsible data sharing. Um, we're promoting diversity in researchers uh, as well as the research we're doing. And I'll talk a little bit about that and being um, as transparent as we possibly can. 
Um, so we have this organizational scheme um, that includes uh, a whole, whole series of working groups. It also includes something really neat, which is that um, we have leads and co-leads for every single working group. The lead is an established investigator. The co-lead is a brand new investigator, someone new to the field of Parkinson's disease. So you get this really nice mix of leaders who, um, who are the up and coming leaders of the field uh, along with the older established um, individuals. Uh, the, the way that it works is that um, we uh, accept data and samples from individuals. So um, uh, clinical data, uh, sometimes genetic data, uh, DNA, blood, um, tissue. Uh, we do all of the harmonization centrally. We produce all of the um, uh, either sequence data or genotype data, return that to the investigators. And then we've worked with a really fantastic program, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership for Parkinson's Disease. Um, a program to allow us to share GP2 data in real time. So again, the idea here is for us to generate data and get it out to the community as quickly as possible. So there'll be no waiting for publication. There'll be no embargoes. It's about getting data out as quickly as possible. The other part of this process, which I think is also rather neat, is that the MPD structure includes um, not only a data store, but uh, the compute resources to actually do data analyses in place. So what this effectively means is the data is really truly democratized. Anybody who has access to the internet can access the data, can spin up powerful compute resources to analyze the data in place, and we will pay for that analysis. So we cover the costs of that analysis. So uh, um, now individuals who are contributing samples from from uh, uh, Lagos, for example, are able to log on, uh, access our compute resources as part of this um, uh, um, AMPD uh, project and uh, analyze GP2 data. There is an additional fact to this, which is around training, which I'll, I'll come back to later. So where are we in GP2? We're just ending at this, we're ending really the startup phase, uh, beginning of year three. Um, We've done a huge amount in terms of um, understanding the issues of compliance and operations. Um, this, this, I will say, has been incredibly challenging. Uh, genetics is relatively easy. Trying to navigate the changing environment of um, where data can be and how data can move, particularly between countries, mu much more, much more challenging. Um, we've, you know, instantiated a whole series of things about uh, how data and samples should flow, how um, we. Um, how we evaluate um, projects, how we ensure that, you know, when a, if someone um, proposes to analyze samples, that we make sure that there is inclusion from uh, our underrepresented colleagues who are contributing samples. We built the data infrastructure to allow analysis, built the pipelines, released the pipelines, even created a genotyping array, which allows us to look at neurodegenerative associated variants across ancestries. So this is a 2 million variant array that, that is now um, commercially available. Form strategic partnerships. Um, I'd mentioned AMPD, working with um, Movement Disorders Society, um, and Michael J. Fox Foundation, Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative, and several groups that have already started to collect samples from around the world. A really important part of this, again, given our given our aim, which is to, to try and level the playing field for researchers around the world, is to build global will and to build capacity at those research sites that have traditionally been underrepresented. So I talked a little bit about having resources for those sites to be able to access and, and analyze data. But of course, training is key here. So we have created several training modules. There are 50 training videos here, um, which really go from soup to nuts, how, you know, if you've never logged on to um, a computer to do any analysis, takes you through that space right the way through to fairly complex genetic and functional analyses that you can perform on um, genotype and sequence data. These 50 lessons are translated into a, a more than 100 different languages, again, trying to reduce the barrier for folks to be able to access this, um, this resource and learn and, you know, really allow us to create a a group of experts around the world that can generate um, generate interesting research questions. Um, that learning management system has uh, more than 500 users now, um, around a third of which are from low to medium income countries. So, so we're really getting um, out to those groups. We have live Q&A sessions with, with LMS users 
and they're helping them navigate the process and helping them deal with any particular analytical questions they have. Um, as part of GP2, we have helped support a, um, a competitive PhD program. Um, so I, I mentioned that we have really, uh, in the first phase, targeted um, uh, new collections uh, across Africa, South America, and throughout Asia. This was targeted for um, uh, Central South America and Asia. So we have new PhD programs all working on GP2, um, uh, these students from Mexico, Chile, um, Taiwan, and Brazil. Um, we've also supported uh, clinical training for uh, um, clinicians from Africa. So uh, these are clinicians from Ethiopia, Ghana, Mali, and Djibouti who are now in a master's um, a clinical program in partnership with the University College London, um, where they come over and train specifically in um, movement, movement disorders. Often these are countries where there are no movement disorder specialists, where there may only be you know, one or two um, neurologists. So again, this idea of trying to build um, global will and capacity. Uh, we've worked with funders on creating um, uh, RFAs that really target diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how to access GP2 data, how to use GP2 data, and, and we are even producing data for um, some of these uh, successful applicants. Um, we've also brought people together. Uh, we run hackathons um, focused on uh, learning how to do analyses and, and uh, bringing teams together around the world. So essentially what you do is bring a group of individuals together with different skill sets, um, they are put into teams and they, um, they um, are, are set a challenge of some kind that they have to deal with over two or three days, usually a coding challenge. Um, um, the last one that we ran, uh, um, run by Hampton Leonard, included almost 50 participants from a dozen different countries. We also have um, meetings to bring the community together with, with a large number of attendees. GP2 has also supported the creation of new, um, a new cohort. Um, this is the uh, Black and African American Connections to PD study or the Black PD um, study. Um, Black and African American Parkinson's disease patients are incredibly underrepresented in uh, Parkinson's disease research. So our aim is here to um, eventually collect around 5,000 uh, patients. The first part um, aimed at uh, understanding genetics, but hoping that this would, would form the hub for future studies. And uh, GP2 also contributed towards the construction of a, a biobank in Lima in Peru, again, with the idea of creating resources to allow um, these groups from around the world to, um, to, to really uh, execute their own research projects. So where are we? I've told you about all the things we planned and, and, um, and how it's gone. So, so far, you know, we're, we're still only two years in. Um, we're about to really start um, ramping up. We have 170 cohorts um, at some point in the process of um, onboarding into GP2, 170,000 samples available. Um, we've now um, genotypes, uh, I think a little over 20,000 um, samples and the first 5,000 are actually released. They're available in AMPD. You can go there now and access uh, genotype data from, from those um, sites. As you can see, it's, uh, um, it's certainly better than it was, but there are many countries that we need to continue to focus on um, and really uh, improve representation. So there are a ton of things we can do in, in um, PD, uh, sorry, in GP2. And um, of course, there are the obvious genetic things that I talk about on the kind of left-hand side of this, of this slide. Um, uh, centered around discovery, finding new risk factors, finding new genes, finding modifiers, also creating resources, you know, um, providing individuals who are working on the functional side of this work with, um, with diverse IPS lines or diverse um, um, brain tissue. But there are more and more other things um, that are coming along, more emerging opportunities and adjacent opportunities. And this really speaks to, I think, the power of what we're trying to create here. Again, we're not trying to create something where um, GP2 does all of the analysis, gets all of the kudos and, and we're done. We're trying to create a framework that allows others to be able to access um, uh, data and resources uh, in order to be able to affect um, research at a global, global scale. Um, so a summary, I, I think it makes sense to give an overall summary of, of, of what I've talked about today. So I think, Progress in PD has been really substantial over the last 25 years. We've literally gone from zero to 
to 100 in that in that period of time. Um, I think um, what is critical for Parkinson's disease, like like many other diseases, is that we have to expand this work to encompass um, diverse populations. Um, it is of course uh, it, it is of course imperative that we do so, not just because it's the right thing to do, but of course it is, but also because scientifically it's essential. It's essential because it um, speeds up our ability to find MAP new loci. It's essential because it will identify particular populations that have a particular genetic form and therefore would be um, uh, would be useful for applying um, uh, clinical trials. There are just myriad reasons that we really need to um, we really need to focus in this space. Our aim in creating GP two and really as an extension of of what we've done in IPDGC and in the lab more broadly is to create a global research community. Um, you know, a, 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 avoiding completely the, um, the, the approaches that have sometimes been used in the past where well-funded labs have come in and taken samples away and published. We're, we're really um, trying to work with these communities to, to, to um, create a, a rising tides that, that floats all boats. I think what has any success we've had, what has been essential in that success has been has been the IRP. It really is a spectacular place to work. I think. Um, I think it allows us to do some things that just can't quite be done easily, or as effectively in the outside world. Um, uh, I'm not saying everyone should be doing projects like this. I'm not saying that all research should be done like this. But I think there's some really unique and special things about the IRP that allow us to really affect large, large change. And um, it's really been an absolute pleasure to work in the IRP um, over the last 20 years or so. I started to put together a thank you slide, but there are too many people to thank. These are folks that are working in, um, in my lab or, or, or I'm working with on various projects. At the moment, I have a picture of IPDGC here. I would love to give a picture of GP2, but there are around 500 members, so it would be, uh, it would be difficult to do. But um, the, the clear message here is, um, although I'm the messenger, this involves hundreds of people who are all willing to work together in a collaborative, easy way. And it's been um, a real pleasure to be a part of that over the last 20 years. I don't know that I have another 20 years of it in me, but um, we'll, I, guess we'll, I guess we'll see. So with that, um, I will stop and, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we have one question in the chat from Joel Seidoff, and the message is, uh, the data on difference in susceptibility based on race and ancestries is very intriguing. How productive you think would be mining for genetic loci, loci that confer resilience? Do you have any suggestion on novel approach in this area? Um. So I can tell you, we have someone in our lab that um, is really interested in this notion of resilience. Um, so I mentioned her earlier, Sarah, Sarah Bandras um, Siga. Uh, I think I think we have a ways to go in that in that space, frankly. But I do think it's a really interesting idea, and the idea of whether resilience um, is uh, one of the things we see. So let me step back a little bit. One of the things we see surprisingly is that there's not a lot of genetic overlap between um, many neurodegenerative diseases. So um, uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are pretty different genetically, but I do wonder, and this is really driven by Sarah's research, um, whether there might be shared factors for resilience across, um, across these diseases. Um, so I, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a good idea. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind. I mean, I, I really enjoy your presentation. I think that uh, there is a kind of a trade-off uh, uh, in the field of neurodegenerative disease between the need uh, to hyperphenotype, so break all the phenotype in many, many different subgroups. Uh, and at the same time, people are talking about, uh, you know, global mechanisms, uh, you know, overall pathway that affect the multiple neurodegenerative disease at the, at the same time. You know, how will we address this, uh, you know, dualism of, 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 
of interpretation on neurodegenerative disease. I wonder whether you've ever thought about it. Yeah, no, I, 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 think I, I think I understand your question. I mean, I think that the, the challenge for us has been that much of what we do is dependent on numbers. So extremely deep phenotyping where you start to see differences um, clinically, pathologically, or maybe, you know, mechanistically, if you're looking at, at biomarkers, is just, we, we just can't quite get there in terms of the numbers. There are some growing, um, there are some growing studies, certainly in the AD field, um, and also in the PD field, the PPMI study as an, as an example, the PDBP studies, where, you know, longitudinal phenotyping is, is, I think, starting to give us an in towards whether there are subtypes. I think one of the um, one of the things that we've tried, um, and I think is the way forward, is to stop thinking about phenotyping in terms of um, what is being presented to us clinically. You know, what is being presented to a clinician as they see a patient, and rather taking um, rather taking quantitative measures and using approaches like AI or ML to tell us what progression looks like, to tell us what subtypes look like. Um, we have a, a computer scientist in our group, Faraz Fagri, who's been working on this in PD and certainly starts to see different, based on, based on presentation and progression, different clusters of PD, different clusters of PD patients. Two uh, more questions, one from Camillo Toro. Could uh, some of these resources use uh, to understand the dietary and exposure factor in PD across the world? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, the, the majority of the samples that, were, that are in the study, in the GP2 study, are, have already been collected. They're, they're prospective collections that were already existing. However, there are quite a few, particularly in underrepresented populations, that are um, ongoing. Um, so we have started to do things like um, uh, deploy questionnaires on, um, on diet and exposure. That is a, that's a tough thing to do, for sure as Luigi knows better than anyone actually. Um, but yeah, we're, we're at least starting to get there. And I think that this kind of illustrates maybe the potential of GP2, right? It's set up as a genetic study, but if someone comes along with a research question like that, we have the connections all in place to be able to, to initiate a study, to be able to take a study like that forward. Well, the last two minutes, I have one question from Stefan Mulio that is quite interesting. Have you found non-coding variants, for example, link RNA or three prime UTRs or something that is not coded? As, your, um, yeah. as, co as causative? Um, as, as, causative, causative. Mm, yeah. as causative, no, not really. Um, but we have, uh, I mean, of course, as risk, yes tons of them. It's, it's kind of understanding what the functional region is. Um, I think this might, though, in part be because we weren't really looking. So my, my guess is that there are things in, in UTRs. Um, there are things in regulatory regions that may affect, um, that may not just affect risk, but may be causative. We just haven't looked. One of the things that, you know, I talked about transformative technologies. One of the, the spaces that we're really investing a lot of time in at the moment is long read sequencing and, and my hope is that I will help resolve some of some of those things we've missed. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Andy, uh, for your science, for your generosity, for producing this wonderful site that I'm sure is real reflecting, uh, you know, on the health uh, of the population. And thank you everybody that have been listening. Please conclude our presentation.